Hello and welcome to Global Expansion Ideas 2010. I'm Lucas Spees with Global Capiche. This is week five, Global Manufacturing and Logistics. So let's jump right into it. What is operations management? Operations management is an area of management that exists to improve business processes to their fullest potential in terms of quality, value, and time to market. When I say time to market here, I don't only mean market entries, new market entries, but it also how long it takes to get from the production table to the hands of the customer. So basically, you know, how fast you can get those wheels turning. Production system methodology. I use here as an example for operations a turbine engine. The reason why I use that is because it has all the elements of an operational system. It has a, an input area, which would be the reservoir, a control gate, an input into the system, a system that actually uh, has a work in progress and that makes change on that input, and then an output here, which would be uh, the outflow of the dam. So I think that this example, the turbine engine, uh, does, does an operational system justice and then it has all the elements. Critical ideas. These are kind of modern ideas. Uh, JIT refers to just in time. It's a program where materials that are required for production are available at the moment of necessity and not before or after. This avoids storage costs or costs of delays in production. JIT, you'll see it again. TQM, Total Quality Management, or TQC, Total Quality Control, refers to a production program that ensures nothing but the highest quality products leave the factory. Quality is keenly assessed at every point in the production process and continually improved. What I mean here is that there's a difference between a quality control, like for example you have a quality control department that reviews a product before it leaves a factory. This is a little bit different. This means that quality is inherent throughout the whole system and as a process the quality of the system is, is improved. Production basics. You have two types of products that are produced. Functional products which are staples to everyday consumption, like soap or food. They have a low profit margin, they have longer life cycles, and they have more predictable demand. Innovative products are the other ones. They're dependent on market swings. They are less predictable, shorter life cycles, and you must continually develop newer ideas and products. Uh, cell phones, computers, any kind of digital type product, software, these are all innovative products. They can even go so far as to like, you know, it's the Winter Olympics right now, skis are innovative products, they try to change them, you know, things like that. There are different types of supply chains. This is a little graph here to show you the different kinds. Demand, uncertainty on the top, supply uncertainty on the bottom. If you have low demand uncertainty, low supply uncertainty, you have what's called an efficient supply chain. If you have high demand uncertainty, but low supply uncertainty, you have a responsive supply chain. If you have high supply uncertainty, low demand uncertainty, you have a risk hedging supply chain. If you have high demand uncertainty and high supply uncertainty, you have an agile supply chain. This is the bullwhip effect with Indiana Jones. Okay, it's for a forecast-driven distribution channel. As consumption of final product varies over time, this creates greater oscillations in supply and demand at the retail level, which in turn increases more at the wholesale, 
production and supply levels. In other words, it magnifies. So for an example, I heard an idea that illustrates the story uh, through a beer example. So I will share this beer example with you. Say there's a new microbrew that is out. This microbrew is an immediate hit and gets ordered at the consumer level. The consumers go to the retail store and they say, I would like to buy two cases of this new microbrew. Maybe this retailer sells out at that point and has to order more. So the retailer orders more beer with this microbrew and when the order arrives, it arrives late and only half the shipment. So when this sells out and the retailer orders more, they double their order thinking that they will only get half the product that they need. So they double their order, it arrives and it's again shorted and it goes up the chain. So they keep continually order more and what will happen eventually is all the shipment, the production will meet up with the demand and the shipments will start to arrive along with past shipments and then the retailer will be overstocked with this beer and not able to, be, to sell it. So it's called a bull-up effect because a little change in one area to handle has a big effect down the line. Balanced scorecard. The balanced scorecard is a tool to make sure that you're not only doing things right, but rather you're doing the right things. A balanced scorecard is what you use when you are considering a new project or a task to make sure that your task aligns with your mission, company mission, or core values. So essentially you talk about with your C-level executives this new product that you're thinking about and uh, if this does align up with your core principles and if it does you know, match up well with, with what the company does. So into project management. There are two critical factors that impact success of a project. Time and budget. Those are the two granddaddies of project management. The critical path is what lays forth the time management, or at least the major player in that. This is a Gantt chart. The Gantt chart is used to show on a timeline what tasks need to be done and what tasks before that will need to be completed before the next one can begin. In other words, this particular project is for a construction project. Site work needs to be completed before the building shell can be started. The building shell needs to be completed before interiors can be started. So you can see there's a dependency that exists. If any area, if any task along that, that project that's on that critical path that has a dependency to it gets delayed, it will delay the whole project. So the critical path needs to be shortened as much as possible and each of those tasks that are on the critical path need to be completed on time to maintain that schedule. That's time management critical path. Cost reduction techniques. One thing that is becoming more popular these days is contract manufacturing. As you can see here, I put together a little graph that is about make or buy decisions. The uh, make or buy is whether you know whether it's cheaper to buy a product from a contract manufacturer or to produce this contract yourself in-house. Now, this basically comes down to you know, mathematical equations, you know, you have to forecast your demand and, and, and so forth, but uh, you know, this is a very important decision to make for companies, especially in new market entry where you may be subject to tariffs or you may be subject to other fees, transportation costs, etc. that will impact your bottom line. So make or buy uh, it's doubly important for, for global managers when you're entering a new market you know, if you have to pay a whole bunch of more costs to import 
to that market or you know to export from your country into that market, uh, it may be worth it to set up a factory and, and make that product locally. Also, product design can be used as a tool to reduce cost. For example, if your design is highly complex, you can do what's called value engineering to reduce the cost of that. Maybe what you can do is simplify your design, use less parts, and that will, you know, in turn change the cost of production with you know labor hours and materials and so forth. So value engineering. 